Here we have two non-conducting concentric cylinders with lens L. This is the side view of the midsection of the cylinders, and this is the cross-sectional view. The inner cylinder has a radius A and a net charge of positive 2Q that is uniformly distributed throughout the entire volume. The outer one is a hollow cylinder with an inner radius B and the outer radius C. It has a net charge of negative 1Q that is uniformly distributed throughout the entire volume. Find the electric field as a function of R near the midsection of the two cylinders. For 1, R is less than or equal to A somewhere inside the inner cylinder. 2, R is between A and B somewhere between the two cylinders. 3, R is between C and B somewhere inside the outer cylinder. And 4, R is bigger than C somewhere out here. And the length of the cylinder L is much, much bigger than the R over here. The cylinders are much longer. Although the cylinders do not have infinite length, we can still approximate the scenario as having cylindrical symmetry because the length L is much, much bigger than the distance. And we are only looking for electric field near the midsection of the cylinders. So we do not have to be concerned with edge effect near the ends. With cylindrical symmetry, we can use Gauss's law. And our Gaussian surface is a cylinder that goes through the location we're interested in. So this cylinder must have a radius little r. However, the height of the cylinder can be anything we choose. So I'm just going to make it with height h. When we use Gauss's law to find the electric field, we're not interested in doing any complicated integration. So we need to be able to take out the e and take out the cosine and be left with integral dA. And we don't need to be able to take out e and the cosine for all parts of the Gaussian surface. We just need to do that for the part of the Gaussian surface that has non-zero flux. Which part or parts of this Gaussian surface has non-zero flux? The curved part of the Gaussian surface has non-zero flux. There is no flux through the top and the bottom because in this cylindrically symmetric situation with positive net charge inside the Gaussian surface, the electric field lines all go radially outward. So none of the field lines go through the top and bottom. Since the top and bottom have zero flux, we only have to consider the contribution from the curved part of the Gaussian surface. And by symmetry, everywhere on this curved part, the electric field has the same magnitude, so we can take it out of this integral. And the radially outward electric field and the outward normal vector dA, they are in the same direction everywhere on the curved part. So we can take the cosine out of the integration. So we have E times uh, cosine 0, which is 1, times uh, the sum of the area of the curved part of the Gaussian surface. For the curved part of the Gaussian surface, if we cut it open, we get a rectangle. The base of the rectangle is the circumference of the circle here. So the base is 2 pi r, and the height is h. So the area of the curved part of the Gaussian surface is the base 2 pi r times the height h. And this equals to the q enclosed over epsilon naught. When we use Gauss's law to find the electric field, the calculation of q enclosed is usually the hardest part. Only a fraction of the 2q is inside the Gaussian surface. What is that fraction? First, the Gaussian surface length is h, and the 2q is distributed throughout the entire L. So 
the fraction is、uh, h over l, but that is、uh, the charge that's within this segment of the cylinder, and the Gaussian surface is only part of this segment. So, what fraction of this charge is actually inside this Gaussian surface? Let's look at the cross-sectional view over here. The inner cylinder has radius a, and the Gaussian surface has a radius r. All this charge is distributed throughout this entire inner cylinder, and what's the fraction that's inside the Gaussian surface? That would be the area of the small circle, pi r squared, out of the area of the entire cylinder cross section, pi a squared, and the pi's cancel, so the enclosed charge is. R squared over a squared times h over l times two q. We can cancel a two. H and a r, and divide by pi on both sides, we get the electric field. Since q pi epsilon naught a squared and l, they are all constants. The electric field strength is proportional to r when the location is inside this uniform charge distribution. For part two, our Gaussian surface has to go through this point we are interested in. So we would have a Gaussian surface, also a cylinder, but with a larger radius, little r. We will still take out the e and the cosine, and it's going to be e times cosine zero times、uh, the Gaussian surface、uh, area for the curved part two pi r h. So we would have e times one times two pi r h, and this would equal to the q enclosed over epsilon naught. So we have to find the charge inside this Gaussian surface. This time. Our Gaussian surface encloses all the charge that's in the inner cylinder for this section, so it is a fraction of the two q, and it is a height h out of height l. We can cancel the h, cancel the two, and then solve for e, and that's what we get. With all these being constants, our electric field is proportional to one over r. Three, same thing. We would just have a wider Gaussian surface because the Gaussian surface has to go through this point, and this part is exactly the same. E times one times two pi r h. It's one cosine zero degrees because for this Gaussian surface, the net enclosed charge is still positive because there's positive two q and then less negative charge. So the net enclosed charge is positive, so we have cosine zero degrees. If the net enclosed charge is negative, then we would have cosine one eighty, which is negative one. And this is the flux, which is still equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. To find the Q enclosed, we have to add the charges that are in here to the charges that are in here. There are more positive charges. The positive charge is a fraction of the positive two q, and uh, it's uh, length h out of the length l, so it's h divided by l. That's the fraction of the two q that's inside the Gaussian surface. And then we have to add the negative charge or minus a fraction of the q that is in there. And this section is h out of l, but we also have only a fraction of that part of the charge that's inside the Gaussian surface. Let's look at the cross section for the outer cylinder. So this is the outer cylinder, but only this part is inside the Gaussian surface. So the fraction. That's inside the Gaussian surface will be this out of the entire area, and the area inside the Gaussian surface is the this circle minus that circle, pi r squared minus pi b squared.
out of uh, this ring, which is uh, the area of pi c squared minus pi b squared. And of course, the pi cancels. So this is the enclosed charge. So the electric field is Q enclosed divided by epsilon naught divided by 2 pi r h. And then we can cancel the h. And that's it. For part four, out here, we would make a cylindrical Gaussian surface that goes like this. And we still have E times uh, 1, because uh, the net enclosed charge will still be positive, times 2 pi rh equals to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So now let's find the Q enclosed for this Gaussian surface. The Gaussian surface out here would enclose all the charges that's in this segment. So it will have H out of L times the total 2Q. And uh, also H out of the total length L of the, the negative Q. Our arbitrary choice of H cancels again. And then we solve for electric field. This part is a constant. So this electric field is also proportional to 1 over R.